I'll call this meeting to order. This is the October 5th, 2015 Committee on Public Safety meeting. I'm Jesse Adams. I'll be chairing by the request of the actual chair, who's Maureen Carney, who can't be here tonight. First, I want to know that this meeting is audio and video recorded. And uh, uh, counselors present are Council Councilor Dwight, Councilor Adams, myself. Absent is Maureen Carney. Uh, Councilor Murphy may arrive. We're not sure if he is coming yet. Are you here to speak in public comment? Hi, uh, about nine to speak. Okay, yeah. well, um, this is a public comment period. If you could come up, sure. speak, uh, s state your name and, and where you live, and yep. go right ahead. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, my name is Louise Corman Martin. I live at 198 North Street. Um, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I heard from Elisa Klein that this would be a good place for me to come and voice my concern. Um, so, um, there's been two accidents this summer um, to our property at 198 Street, Street due to speeding on Nonsense Street. Um, the first accident occurred on June 7th and a car traveling westbound on Nonsense Street coming from the high school towards Pine Street at a very high rate of speed swerved and crossed the center line of the street and struck our fence and actually physically entered our yard and the driver was cited for speeding and drunk driving. And then just recently, um, on the evening of September 20th, a similar accident occurred. Um, same situation, a driver heading westbound on Oxford Street, Street, swerving across the lane um, into our fence, damaging our fence and entering our yard. And um, I have a copy of the police report with me, um, but the police report cites, quote, that a witness observed that he saw the car swerve to the left to avoid the cones in the street and drove straight into Mr. Martindale's fence. So the cones that he is referring to is part of the other construction that's happening right now at the bottom of Maple Street. So um, these were scary incidents. Um, we feel really lucky that no one was hurt, both in our yard, but also cyclists, pedestrians, other drivers, the drivers, um, and our neighbors. Um, and the speed has gotten out of hand. Um, and I'm aware and so grateful that traffic comp study is underway. I'm, I'm totally aware of that. I was part of um, the group that came and spoke to the traffic and parking commission in August. And so we're very grateful for that and hopeful that we'll soon see some positive changes to the speeding on Nonatuck Street. But in the meantime, I'm here um, today to see if there's any immediate safety measures that can be taken because the construction's been delayed. Um, my understanding is that it's happening at the end of October, early November, which is great. Um, but um, the speeding is still out of hand and people are going through the construction site at sometimes what seems to be like 40 or 50 miles an hour. Um, and it's very confusing. So part of the current issue and the cause of the most recent accident to our fence is not just the incessant speeding coupled with the construction um, at the bottom of Nantuck Street, but really what's happening is that people are coming westbound from the high school and they're avoiding the construction and swerving into the eastbound lane and not using the westbound lane. And so they're driving against traffic as you know, with the risk of swerving into our fence, or our yard, or our driveway, or our neighbors. Um, and so I don't know what the solution is. I'm not asking for an extreme measure like a guardrail or a concrete barrier. We don't want that. We think that's a band-aid to the problem. But I'm here today to ask if anything can be done to create a safer driving environment at this intersection until the construction is complete and until the traffic calming study gets underway, um, a solution that might just temporarily slow traffic at that intersection. A few ideas I've had, I know they're not up to me, but um, a temporary speed bump b before and after the construction. Um, more frequent police patrolling, and I know that you uh, we have noticed that there's more frequent patrolling, so I want to thank you for that. Um, a speed monitoring device near this intersection, like we've had further down on Monotuck Street. I don't know if there's a way to place that closer to the intersection. 
Um, or even having the DPW check the cones and the signs that are constantly being hit. I've actually brought photographs, um, which I can, I don't know, pass around. Or, I, I think I emailed these too. Um, but the cones are just constantly getting hit, and it's, it's, it's really scary. Um, because people are then avoiding what is going to become a mess at the bottom of the hill. Um, another thought I had was we could just enact a very temporary reduced speed limit in the construction zone, like you see on highways, you know, like reduced speed um, to 20 miles an hour. Um, so the other thing I should note too is that the, while these measures would be temporary, I feel like they should also be lifted during the traffic calming study because <laughs> if we're doing such a slow traffic now for our safety, um, that could impact the traffic co traffic comment study, and I want to make sure that the traffic comment study is an honest depiction of what's really happening. Um, so I just want to bring that to your attention. Um, so, and the other the other thought I had was that where the Maple Street where Ma the Maple Street Hill comes down across is not tuck and bends around towards Riverside mm -hmm. Drive, there's no stop sign, um, so cars coming eastbound from Riverside Drive across Maple, they just whiz around that corner and keep going. And so when traffic's coming westbound and avoiding the construction, we've seen a lot of near misses right right in front of our front door and driveway. And so that's really scary. And I went online and submitted um, a sign request um, through the Department of Public Works, but the response I got was that there's already a stop sign in place, which there isn't. Um, there's one at the bottom of the hill, but not one if you're coming from Riverside Drive, crossing over Maple and going up. It's, there's not even a yield sign. I mean, even a yield sign would be better. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. It's scary, and it's it's just kind of really bad, and I, I don't know what to do. Um, but I also don't want it to have a temporary solution. It would be great if that could be considered. Um, and if those temporary mission, temporary solutions could be put in place and then they could before the traffic comes um, which I understand you see the end of October or early November once the construction is completed. And they, they just closed the bridge today. I know, so that's gonna impact the study. So there's too. no detour routing. You're right. up close to thirty mile an hour speed limit at that yeah. point until you get to Hill and not and um, the traffic calming measure that you requested, of course, is doing a census, and, and I'm sure they explained to you the criteria for qualification. They did, for, uh, and so I saw it on the website too, yeah. So speed, accident history, and volume yeah. of traffic. Yeah. So the vol you're right, the volume of traffic and speed and all those issues are not going to be ad accurately reflected right. uh, during this period. Right. And, I, and I haven't seen, I was just there today, and I haven't seen any uh, speed sensors. So no, the, so, I was informed because the city was going to do the traffic calming study immediately. It seemed like they were going to implement it in August after that meeting. What? And then one of our neighbors wrote or contacted the DPW and asked if they wait until the construction be complete so we could get more accurate. Right, you know, the, the construction was supposed to be completed by that I know. So yeah. And I understand that it's delayed and nothing can be done about that. I'm more wondering what can be done in, in, the, in, the, in the interim because it's, it's, it's like five, our house shakes. You know, like big semi trucks are coming from the factories down in that area going both ways and they'll go outside of the coned area, outside of the construction area into the westbound lane and they're going like 40 miles an hour. You know? I mean, what seems, I, I don't know, but. They're not going 30. They're not going close to speed limit. Well, it, did you present before uh, Councilor Adams of the committee, the Public Works Committee? Did? No, but I think Elisa Klein spoke on my behalf. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the authority of the council is somewhat limited. We don't yeah. have the authority to actually um, charge any department with anything. We can right. make requests. And we can advance the request, yeah. and the mayor can as well, and the chief yeah. is here, and, and she's heard your concerns. And yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, but the, the council in and of itself doesn't, we don't, we can't tell the departments what to do. No, I understand that. But, um, well, what we did do is 
in that committee. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Mm -hmm. um, we made a request. Okay. Um, Councillor Klein presented some of what you presented yeah. to us, and we were sufficiently concerned, given the two accidents and the fact that you have a baby there, that um, that we thought that this rose to uh, uh, emergency situation. And in the past, in some situations, um, the mayor has taken emergency measures for traffic dangers. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the, the person who was yeah. hit, hit, uh, killed yeah. over there, and then subsequent, after that tragedy, subsequent um, traffic measures were the barrels, uh, the barrels were, were, were put, even, you know, without ordinance or any council, you know, approval, they're deemed an emergency, and we were concerned that that you know this this could be a tragic situation potentially if, if uh, something weren't done so what we did was we we do we we asked councillor klein to go ahead and make a request to the mayor that some sort of emergency measures take place i think that's what we that's what we did we just made her we made councillor specter and uh and myself and, and councillor klein decided that i believe that she that she councillor klein would make some request to the mayor to, to take some sort of measure to to protect that and i also think you, you guys have you know talked about bringing it here because you know the police department was on the agenda for today and, and this would be a good forum for right you know, for that particular issue right i guess my concern is just like what what an immediate safety measure would look like because the issue is I mean, the issue is people driving to our fast so the issue is actually speed it's a coincidence that people are landing our yard. They could be landing in our neighbor's yard on the other side of the street or next door to us or the medical building because they're avoiding all these, uh, the cones and the signs that keep falling. Um, you know, so I don't think like a guardrail would be the solution. It's sort of like how could we, how could traffic actually be slowed while the construction is happening? in that area and I, and I don't know the answer to that because i'm not a traffic engineer but well, the, you know we have i don't know if we i don't even think i don't know if it's our inventory we had yeah. temporary speed bumps mm -hmm. the, the problem is just marking them yeah. making sure that everyone's aware of the speed bumps mm -hmm. um even in the, tra the temporary ones and right. as i said we've only used those in the past to test the efficacy in a particular situation okay. um, because this is, and I, and again, I'm not speaking with any authority yeah, or yeah. actually any unique knowledge, but there's, um, this is such a fluid situation now. The, the traffic pattern is about to change again as of today. Oh, yeah. And um, you said one of the accidents was an OUI or a drunk driving It was. So, so I just got quickly like that first one, I and mean, it, it was cited as being right. drunk driving and due to speed. And then the second one was someone avoiding the Somebody raised structures. Somebody avoiding the raised the cones yeah. that are marking the structures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I feel like, the, I mean, the first one is, is due to speeding on the street, right. which is already being addressed through the traffic calming study. But it's just the fact that it keeps happening. And I'm kind of like, is it going to happen a third time? You know, I mean. I'm no. praying it's not, I'm hopeful it's not, but after the first accident, we thought, oh, this is just a fluke, and... Well, the residents on Nanata, um, for, well, since I've been in office, which was a long time, mm -hmm. have always been concerned about issues of, of safety and speed. Mm -hmm. And it's also a lot to do with the fact that there's no sidewalks on one side of the road. Yeah. There's, um, it is a shortcut route for a lot of people coming yeah. from the out of wards or from out of town, trying to get to a work and doing shortcuts. Right, and the high school. Um, and speed probably, as the road is improved, of course, speed will pick up, but that's, mm -hmm. uh, not a tuck's not getting resurfaced except for that juncture at, at, at um, mm -hmm. with the uh, Naples. Yeah. And then so up, by, up by the bridge. Like it's only the like westbound thing. Right, there. right. Yeah. So the fact that it's fluid and changing, it's hard to, uh, and I, I'm just speculating, it's gonna yeah. be kind of hard to find any one fix that's gonna address it, but it, the chief is aware of it, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and there are details that were sent out during the construction, right? Yeah. And, uh, 
as mandated by law, but they're usually up on Pine Street directing the mm -hmm. intersection traffic and stuff because it's such a big project at this point. Yeah. Um, so the details usually go to where they're actually people working, right? mm -hmm. as opposed to I mean, Posting an office down at the bottom of Maple Street, we don't have the I don't think we have the yeah. we don't have the manpower or the ability yeah, to do yeah. that on that end of the day. I'm sitting in my house and look out the window, you'd make a lot of revenue for this city. <laughs> Jody, the um, the speed board, is that available? It's not because we just had to move it yesterday due to a speedy complaint on another residential street. Right. So we just moved it like this yeah. morning actually, and we only have the one. Yeah. Okay. Is it, is it, there's not a way to like temporary lower the speed limit that's probably, so I, I certainly don't have that yeah. power. <laughs> I think actually the, by state law and on a construction right. site or Isn't anything it? that where there is construction you are supposed to proceed with caution and reasonable speed. Yeah. There's some flexibility in there right. but certainly not exceed the speed limit yeah. and the, the implication is that you go slower. Mm -hmm. um, but people don't do that. No. Unfortunately, <laughs> Yeah. That's the variable we can't manage as well, only with regulation, that yeah. damn people thing. That's the yeah. tricky part. So next step would be, I guess, just to well, wait for the traffic cop and study and hope nothing happens until... Well, I think, you know, is that they're eventually going to be coming down here with the work, so there will be an officer on duty That's at that right. site. Yeah. And there will be, um, and if the speed uh, board becomes available, that would be to go to some, yeah. you know, those traditionally keep the honest people honest. I know. The OUI drivers and the people were just hell bent on speeding anyway. There's, there's we nothing just, short of. We just put a go homemade go slow sign up, yeah. and we've noticed the nice people listen, and yeah. the not nice people give you the finger and pour it and speed up. So I almost feel like it's not. It's doing the opposite, you know. The most effective form of. Um, education and um, speed calming, traffic calming that I've ever seen that's worked in the community over and over again, mm -hmm. sat on Riverside Drive too. So the neighborhood got together and they all put up their own signs saying just to please slow down. Yeah. And the thing is people always remember that even when the signs come down, they will remember that. He, and it will keep the honest people honest. It doesn't require city approval or anything. And, and, and if you're lucky, it'll obscure the political signs that are all going up like weeds now too. So that, that um, it just increases awareness. So in, if you're keeping the honest people honest and they're going the speed limit, the person behind them can't do anything but go the speed limit. It, it's, it's, not, it's not a panacea that doesn't solve the problem, but it certainly does. Yeah. As you increase awareness and that the community is aware, as the neighborhood's aware and the driver's aware that the neighbors are aware and that it's a concern, it does have an impact. It has an effect. Yeah. Um, we could put up more signs ultimately, but those those are municipal signs of people, as you know, I mean look, there's there's signs all over this place and no one's paying attention to them. So um, yeah, I realized I didn't offer you a single solution. No. I I, <laughs> um, I mean I I'm I'm hopeful that the traffic calming study will will find what we know to be true and that a positive outcome will of that, um, it just feels like it's gotten exponentially worse over the past, since the construction started. Um, so well, certainly the construction, and I think now with the detour, you're probably going to see more. Yeah. How long have you lived there? Two years since I've been Yeah, the first year it seemed fine. Like, we, we bought the house and it was a heavy traffic street, and we're okay with that, because it's how we can afford to live in North Hampton, we're happy to be back. But, we didn't realize that speeding was such an issue. Um, you know, a lot of cars going 30 or 25 miles an hour is fine when they're like whipping by you and you're out in the backyard gardening with a baby. It's just, it makes you really tense and scared. So, yeah. And I, I know all my neighbors share that this concern. Um, you know, as I said, yeah. it's been, yeah. and I know many of your neighbors, yeah. and I know, mm -hmm. and in fact, actually, when their kids were small, mm -hmm. they were also very yeah. concerned, yeah. and you have a spectrum of generational yeah. representation on that. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not that we're blissfully ignorant of the situation. No. And, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah, so we're just waiting for the traffic comments and seeing what's next. Yeah. And, and I think, I don't think that the DPW is pretty sharp. They're not going to conduct the traffic comment study during the construction. Yeah, they wait for the Pine Street Bridge construction yeah. to be done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for listening. And yeah, sharing this. Thank you for actually taking, yeah. making the effort. Not a lot of people do. It's yeah, well, usually it's, just. It's, it's serious to us, and we want to see something get done. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Can't prove me. Uh, I, I checked. Murphy called me, left a message. He, he can't make it. He got tied up. So we can't do meeting minutes. Uh, can't prove those. Um, I feel like we just had our discussion on 9th Up Street. <laughs> uh, unless we want to take a vote like the Public Safety like the Public Works Committee did. I'd like to hear if the Chief has any thoughts on this. Uh, same as you, I don't have any solution to it. We definitely recognize that I, I think cars go fast on 9th Up Street. You know, I think the tracker study will probably reveal that. And then we'll have to you know, make determinations on where we're going to go from there. I, I, I filled out an email uh, from that resident prior, and I, I do feel bad for her. I understand they're scared in their home. Um, but I don't have any great way to solve it. We have a lot of officers up there running radar, but the problem right. continues. I mean, and that's always been the issue. I mean, people want enforcement, thinking enforcement will be the correct behavior. When in fact, that's what it has more to do with education than because right. Right. Um, they don't all see the ticket getting issued and just speed the next day. You can't have a you can have a cruiser. We don't have the capacity to have a cruiser there all the day, all the day. Right. Uh, and now, presentation by the North Indian Police Department. I brought updates for you both. As you both know, uh, I took over as chief just on, on July 1st, so it's been a very busy first three months uh, that I've been in there. I know about the promotions of John Cartlidge, Captain of Operations, and Dave Callahan, our lieutenant, and Pat Moody, to acting sergeant. So it was got those done pretty quickly and we're very glad those are great promotions they're all doing well they're all done with their training working on regular details um, we also filled some special assignments Loanne Caputo transitioned into the detective bureau replacing uh, Moody who moved up to sergeant uh, Brendan McKinney was selected as detective he's going to begin in January he's, that's not filled right now due to staffing uh, Matthew Montini one of our newer officers has been selected as a drug recognition expert this is a great uh, opportunity for us. We have two DREs on our department right now, drug recognition experts. These are officers who specialize in drug uh, impaired driving with drugs uh, versus alcohol. And that can be really challenging. And we've seen over the years an increase in the number of operators that we pull over. They're impaired, no order of alcohol, you know, they're under the influence of something else. Um, so DREs specialize in this. There's only 89 in the whole state. So we have two already and we're adding one more. Uh, we're excited about that. Also like that the training is free. That's a two-week training uh, that the officer will go to, and then he's actually flown out to Arizona and t does a bunch of assessments out there as part of the training also. So uh, looking forward to having him get that certification. Uh, we've selected Josh Wallace is our new SRO. You've heard about that. There's been some coverage in the paper. Um, he has that position. He's, he's doing a great job up there. He's settled into the high school. And he is funded by a grant, a 15-month grant that we got for uh, his salary and benefits only. Uh, but that is going well so far. Uh, for staffing, we have three officers who are just about to wrap up the end of their field training uh, program. And then they'll be on their own just in about a month or so. We have seven who are in the academy, it's a really high number. Uh, that will uh, definitely put heavy weight on our field training program when they come out. But uh, we have seven in there, and that would make our department fully staffed. So technically, right now, we are fully staffed. We have no vacancies, which uh, we're very happy about. Um, and they'll be out in around June of 2016. Of course, we have two retirements before then, so we won't be fully staffed when they get out. But uh, for the interim, uh, we are. So that's just an update on our staffing situation. Uh, when I took over as chief, the um, President had just released the uh, President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. I have it here. It's a fascinating document if you haven't already read it. 
Uh, I have my copy, but you can access it online. This was put together. This is kind of the guiding, how we're guiding police departments. I think if you're a progressive, modern police chief, you need to understand this document and understand the messages that it's sending. Um, it was, this task force was put together right after Ferguson. There's a lot going on in our country, clearly, and the president felt that we really need to pay attention to this issue and try to figure out, like, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? So for six months, the task force studied this. They, they did a, a lot of research, and they had a lot of meetings and talked about it and ultimately produced this document, which has um, six pillars that it identified as being critical to how you run a police department. Um, those are building trust and legitimacy, uh, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, and officer wellness and safety. So pretty much most of the recommendations that they suggested came directly under one of those pillars. There were 62 recommendations and 91 action items. Uh, fortunate for our department and for our city, uh, we are already in compliance with a lot of those recommendations. Certainly there's some that we weren't, and they made some recommendations for some things, and we immediately made some changes, simple things, but just really mostly based on being a little bit more transparent, putting a few more things on our website and making those things accessible to members of the public. A good example of that is simply producing how many, how much diversity you have on your police department, you know, and not making people come in and ask you and track it down. That information is on our website. So it's a pretty simple recommendation and one that we were able to comply with very quickly. So I'm pleased that we're in compliance with most of those things, recommendations that we were able to take and uh, kind of hit the ground running with. Uh, shortly after I took over also, uh, I established my own goals for the department. I had about 25 of those goals. And I asked all of my supervisory staff to think of their own goals that they wanted, what they wanted to happen with the police department. We had a meeting, we shared those goals, we talked about the ones that we thought would be most valuable to us and to the city, and ultimately came up with a list. So that list is posted in our police department for our staff. They're broken up into short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. I wanted to be as transparent with the officers as I am with the community, so I wanted them to see what we're working on. I didn't want them to wonder what we were doing, and I wanted them to know where we were going so that there was no confusion about that. Some of the, those goals, just to give you some examples, are things like researching the possibility of um, obtaining national accreditation. I don't know that we'll do that. The goal is just researching it to see what it would cost, and that's really the most prohibitive portion of acquiring national uh, accreditation. We are already accredited to the state, so we have that, but that would be a nice addition, uh, but potentially an expensive one. So we're looking into that. Uh, we're looking at e-citations, which are, you can use your license and swipe, swipe your license in the car instead of handwriting the whole time. Uh, we're looking at uh, the addition of a community services sergeant. Uh, we want to have a department photo taken. Uh, we're looking at an employee fitness program. Uh, we're changing the assessment and evaluation forms. We're looking at different, mostly smaller uh, mobile computers. We're looking at doing some OUI roadblocks. And we're looking at instituting a training that addresses implicit bias and systematic racism. A big, big goal is improving building the firing range. Right now we have a really big closet in our basement. So I'm working on that project. Um, so those are just a few. There's more on there, but it's to give you an idea. Some have to do with internal operations of the department and morale and those sorts of things. Other has to do with technology uh, and our general operations in the department. So far, we had some other goals that we have already accomplished. Uh, we implemented uh, new detail software. Detail so we used to sign our details, the officer standing out on the street conducting uh, traffic details. We used to do those on a pen and paper system. Uh, we've transitioned over to an electronic system that is web-based, so now officers don't have to line up uh, every Thursday at a set time uh, waiting for the sheet to come out. So that's gone over very well. Uh, that's had a lot of bonuses. It's actually freed up some of the time of uh, Maureen O'Donnell, who works in our records bureau. She used to manage all these, and now it's much easier to manage using this online platform. Uh, we also have implemented our community outreach officers uh, at no cost. These are uh, this also was covered by the Gazette. You may have uh, seen those. We have one assigned to Florence, and we have two assigned to downtown. So far, I've heard very positive feedback about those uh, gentlemen out there working. Uh, they're, they're doing a great job. They really, each of the three, have really good understanding of what our expectations are of those officers. Uh, we also 
appointed some community liaison officers, again, also at no cost. Uh, they had specialty assignments, including just really being a bridge to communities that may require that, uh, the GLBTQ community, multicultural community, and religious communities. And all of our liaisons have already reached out to members of those groups and uh, gotten to know members of that community a little bit. Uh, we were also able to update the website. That was also covered by the Gazette. You may have seen or uh, been on our website. We uh, worked with Web Tactics out of East Hampton and did a huge redesign and took into consideration some of the recommendations from that task force report as well. Um, we updated our policy on promotion. We also implemented a Coffee with a Cop program. That's once a month where our officers get to sit in a coffee shop and have coffee with members of the public. We have one coming up on October 20th from 2 to 3 at the Walter Savo House. The first one was great. We had some folks show up and it was uh, well attended and the officers really enjoyed it as well. Um, so those are just uh, to give you an idea of some of the changes that we've both done and some of the things that we plan to be working on. Uh, in general, in the community, some of the things that we continue to work on as a, as a community and as a department, certainly dealing with the heroin problem and, and prescription medications and all things around that. I continue to serve on the executive board of Hampshire Hope uh, and work with that group to put in place strategies that will target this ongoing issue. Uh, we're also always working on youth substance abuse. Josh Wallace, our school resource officer, is part of now Northampton Prevention Coalition. I used to be a part of that, and then when I moved into this position, um, Josh has taken that over, and that targets use substance use and abuse. Uh, we continue to deal with uh, challenges on calls related to mental health. Lieutenant Craig Kerouac is our diversion officer for mental health uh, issues. He works really well with the stakeholders in our community. And uh, he wrapped up a branch that we had for a while, but he's still continuing to perform as the mental health uh, liaison. We're also working on interagency and communication response. Uh, we have worked before with a regional working group. I had actually started it when I was a captain, uh, basically understanding that if a large scale event happens, we're really going to want to have good working relationships, communication, equipment, knowledge of our immediate surrounding communities. So Captain College has taken over that, working on that regional group. Uh, we're working with East Hampton, Amherst and Greenfield, uh, Franklin and Hampshire counties, uh, to put into place a number of different solutions to best address how we handle large scale events. A great example is our, we just purchased a bunch of portable radios that uh, we were able to get actually from last year's budget. Uh, we're on a VHF station. Some of the surrounding communities, it's kind of like a checkerboard. Some of them are on a, a, v, a UHF station. Uh, so if we crossed into their community in the past, we wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate with them. But now with the portables and all the cruisers, we're able to do that. So that's just an example of something that arises out of that group is trying to improve our communication needs. We also just purchased using a grant a uh, fingerprint scanner. We had one for a long time. I think it was about 12 years old, somewhere in that range. Uh, but it was certainly at the end of its life. Uh, we used to do, when I came on the job, we rolled ink prints. Then uh, maybe in 2001-ish, we implemented a, a new one we purchased when we rolled digital scan. And that was dying. So we replaced this with a grant. It was like just under $20,000. And we have that in place now. It was delivered uh, around September 10th. Uh, we continue to offer and, and work on sending people to a lot of training. Just to give you an example of that, in 2014, uh, we sent our staff to over 18,000 hours of training. Uh, of that, about 8,600 was academy hours. We did have people in the academy. About 4,800 was field training. So that has to do with hiring our new recruits. But even after you take that out, we still have about 5,000 hours of training that we offered to our veteran staff. Uh, we did our firearms training this past summer. We avoided any issues with overlapping with Ryan Road School. We had had some um, conflict up there prior with the officers doing their firearms training during the school day. We tried to accommodate around that and we did as best we could last year. This year we were able to have it in the summer. Um, that is another uh, good reason we'd like to finish that range uh, in our basement. And we're still working under a, a lot of different grants. Uh, some of the more notable ones, the Underage Alcohol Enforcement Grant allows us to do party patrols and compliance checks along with the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Uh, another one is the Executive Office of Public Safety Grant. It's drive sober, sober or get pulled over 
also traffic enforcement so those officers are out there keeping pretty busy. Uh, we also work with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's pedestrian bike branch through the Department of Transportation. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, when officers are working this assignment, they go out and when they see pedestrians or bikers who are not yielding to traffic and who are not obeying the law, the people are stopped and they're given an informational brochure and then they're asked why they committed their violation. Uh, the DOT is trying to develop information and figure out why it is that bicyclists feel like they don't have to stop at stop signs or whatever they may be doing um, to better target uh, education in the future and enforcement. So we have that grant. I mentioned the SRO grant that we have still engaged in the Bulletproof Vest Partnership through the Bureau of Justice Assistance. They, our vests expire every five years, our Bulletproof Vests expire. They're very expensive, they're about 800 apiece. So we get that usually covered uh, by this grant partnership. 50% is paid by the state, 50% by um, the feds. And we'll be doing a big best purchase this year, so that would be very helpful. That's an overview of our general operations inside. Our call volume continues to be very busy. We're in about uh, the first six months of the year, we're at 18,000. Uh, if, if we continued on that path, that would be 36,000 for the year. Uh, last year we had about 32,000, so our call, call volume continues to increase. If you looked at a graph, you would continue to see it move up over the years. Um, the number of custodies we have is on par with other years. Uh, the number of car accidents also on par. So our activities are pretty much the same in those areas, uh, other than just our general call volume. And that's an overview of all of our operations in the department right now. Um, a few things. Yeah, actually, great. That's excellent. That, that's excellent. Actually, I like the fact that you'll be fully staffed for a brief moment anyway. In that yeah. specific case. <laughs> and, um, and as you remarked, you have a, a very young department, you have a, but it also seems a department amenable to proceeding with progressive policing standards and, and, and the change and being able to adjust the change. I was at a question it was more about um, the recent <coughs> response to a party at Smith College, which we don't usually see actually a uh, response to uh, fights at a party. And I, it makes sense. I was reading the article. It makes sense that you guys monitor radio traffic from from the security board department at at Smith. Um, and I don't anticipate this trending this way, the way that UMass has to have, that they really have to devote a lot of resources and energy to responding uh, to UMass Amherst. And the Amherst PD clearly has a, has a larger student population that tends to be uh, act out more than Smith has historically. But do you expect that, the, that you guys have to do any different training or any more equipment purchases that might be relevant to potential problems on campus? Um, not specific to on campus. I think in general, we have a great relationship with Smith College Public Safety. The college is a great neighbor in our community. We rarely, rarely go up there for any calls. We, I know, I actually haven't read the article in the paper yet, but I'm aware it was, I know it was in there. And um, I know that in April we responded to a large party up there, and now we have this one. I, I, I think you know it's a little too soon to call to any sort of trend. Right. Uh, they're they're very much on top of things. And Captain Cartledge already had communication with Public Safety up at Smith today and just talked to them about responses uh, and you know what we could do better, what what any of us could be doing better to best respond to these. These are tricky, you know. And um, I got a couple calls from the media today on this. Four, it was originally reported as something like three or four hundred people up there, and. You know, I, I know I was being asked through the media, like, should they have had more staffing? I don't know how many staffing, staff members you could possibly have on to handle a crowd that big that was, like, other than, you know, 20 or 30 or 40, which is completely unreasonable for uh, Smith College, you know. Um, so <laughs> those are tricky to handle. Unfortunately, things like that happen. Uh, the media was wondering if that was kind of normal response to have mass state police and us and East Hampton or whoever else was involved. And absolutely, you know, that's what we do when we have those large scale events. Um, we do need to always keep up on our training in those areas and our equipment. Thankfully, uh, we're, we're doing moderately okay with our uh, tactical equipment right now. Uh, we do need a little more for the new hires because we're just hiring. We have three in the field training and seven that are in the academy, so we'll have to get them up to speed with all of the equipment. I was talking to Captain Cartlidge prior to this event, though, when I'm related, just about doing a good um, 
crowd control training. We have very little of it in the academy, and then really our department, you know, quite honestly, we have so many protests and things that occur here that our officers kind of learn that way. Uh, but there probably could be some, some better methods out there that might be helpful to our department. So again, unrelated to the event at Smith, but we've been talking about it earlier in the month uh, about trying to get this kind of training to Northampton. Uh, the problem is it's expensive. The training itself isn't expensive, but getting the uh, officers, if they're going to be on overtime, to go to that. If I was going to train every person on the department, it would be very expensive. So it's a matter of trying to find a funding source for that. Right, I, and yeah. I agree with you. I don't think there's a trend here, but it's still, yeah, and clearly the dynamic and a, you know, rambunctious party versus a protest mm -hmm. tends to be that they, our protests tend to be fairly steady. Um, mm -hmm. They're demonstrative, but there's not, there's, you know, not vandalism usually associated with it or any other violent outbursts. And then right. in this case, you have, if someone, if you have, a number of people inebriated who are fighting, that's a different issue. And I, and I know that you guys are pretty well versed in that to the bar scenes and, mm -hmm. and dealing with that on that level. So The other thing was I was actually pleased to hear <coughs> about the, um, you know, non-citation citations noting of uh, educating bike riders. I mean, I think, um, the community wants to be bike friendly, but at the same time, some of the conflicts that arise. And, and, and it should be noted that I, I noted that, that once upon a time, bike patrol officers also used to violate the same laws that they were asking to enforce. They would be going the wrong way in the street or across the sidewalks, usually, and not always in, in pursuit, but usually just for convenience sake. And there were, and we had one notable death at the intersection uh, uh, four years ago, maybe. Um, of a person riding a bike and just blowing through the intersection and not, not paying attention to the light. And now that we have marked lanes, um, I just see people going the wrong way on the bike path and I, or on the bike lanes and um, hopping up on the sidewalk when it suits them, not signaling. The, the traditional thing of acting like a pedestrian when it suits them and then acting like a, a vehicle when it suits them to, whatever gets them through. So anything, and the same thing with pedestrians, of course, that's often the conflict you see downtown. Pedestrians um, not staying in the crosswalk or stepping out, so it creates um, a tension that we could probably avoid as, as people become more educated and aware of the same way that people, drivers are enculturated to stopping at, the interse at, at intersections and crosswalks for pedestrians and giving you them right away. But, always acknowledging that the order of vulnerability, a car is the least vulnerable when compared to a bicycle or a pedestrian. So, but I'm glad to hear that you're doing that. I, that's, that's, that's good news. I think it's, I've often had people complain that we should charge people with jaywalking. And I point out, I think the fine's a hundred, uh, is a dollar eighty or something like that. It's something mm -hmm. really, it's, it's nominal and not really effective as far as that goes. But I think, talking to someone and talking out with them and talking about the citation or even just being noted by a police officer make a big difference. So um, I'm psyched to hear about that. I deal with the floor. Do you have anything else? No. Thank you so much, Jody. Thanks a lot. It's yeah. uh, enjoy the honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> I have no new business. Okay. Can't adjourn without a vote, so <laughs> at the we risk never of, officially could be that at the risk of well I can just call it in order. Yeah. But at the risk of going on for I think we're just gonna yeah. break the rules and, and I'm really grateful <laughs> that you're doing that. Thanks. So we sort of